the world you step down into darkness open my eyes let me see beauty that made this heart you to Epic Church one more time. Thank you for joining us today, whether you're online or you're here with us in person. Um, I wish I was there in person, uh, but our family is away this weekend. We're getting a little bit of vacation out in Jasper. So this was recorded ahead of time, but we're so happy that you can join us. 
um, in community and worshiping together. Um, the date was August 5, 1949, and his name was Robert Wagner Dodge. And he had been a veteran of the U.S. Forestry Service for over a decade. Uh, everybody just called him Dodge. And he had just jumped out of a C-47 airplane. There was a forest fire that was happening. It was his job uh, to stop that fire. He was what was known as a smoke jumper. And as he landed on the ground, he was able to meet his crew for the first time. This is the first fire that they're trying. And the first thing that he notices is that the crew is really young. Um, he's got a guy who actually lied about his age. He's only 17 years old. The other one is 18 years old, 19 years old, and it goes on and on like that. The fire was just out of uh, Helena, Montana. It was 16 acres. It was a pretty uh, regular fire, nothing out of the ordinary. They landed. They went to go see the fire. They could see it. Um, there was nothing truly unusual. It felt maybe a little warmer than most fires are. But it was, you know, pretty run of the mill. It was actually on the other side of the river. So uh, Dodge said, let's have some food. So everybody paused and they had some food. And finally at uh, 5.45 p.m., they decided that they were going to go ahead and start uh, fighting the fire. So they were, they were supposed to go down a gulch. So it was like a valley down to where the fire was, which was on the other side of the river. In his mind, Dodge thought they had a thousand yards before they could ever even see the fire. But as they started walking down that narrow uh, valley, down to the bottom of the fire, all of a sudden he could see an orange glow. It was like, I shouldn't be able to see that glow just yet, as the men were just happily walking behind him. You know, this is their first. What's the worst thing that can happen your first day on a job, right? So as they were walking, uh, they went around the bend and they saw that the fire was actually not a thousand yards away. It was 200 yards away. The fire had jumped. Um, even to this day, people don't know how that happened. Um, some theorize that maybe it was the shape of that canyon, of that gulch, of Man Gulch. That's what the place was called. Uh, maybe somehow it was able to bring wind in. Also, at the same time, there was a thunderstorm on the other side. So maybe that all created uh, the perfect firestorm. So there they were, the fire was only 200 yards away, but still, none of the men panicked. Dodge was the only one in the group who, who kind of knew something was off, and he told them, we are going to turn around and just march back from where we came from. Uh, another option that he had is maybe he could, he could do a right angle and go right, right to the mountain, right to the rock slide, do, do a right angle. But he could see that the fire was starting to move on the treetops. And uh, the, that, you call that a crown fire. And that moves at 120 feet per minute. So this guy's experience, always doing math in his head, he realized we don't have enough time to make that right angle. We need to just walk back from where we came from. They started marching 450 yards back where they came from. Still, no panic. This is... 5.45 p.m. No panic. In fact, one of the guys actually takes out a camera, right, to, to take a picture of the fire. There is zero panic. At 5.53 p.m., the fire has covered a hundred yards. And Dodge, Dodge sends out the word, drop your packs, drop all your equipment, and begin to run. You have to run to the ridge. You have to run from where we came from, get to higher ground. Um, people sense that there's panic. They stop dropping their packs. Some of the guys still don't hear the message and he goes around them and he, and he taps their shoulder. You got to get out of here. You got to start running. And uh, they, they begin to run. And pretty soon, uh, desperation kicks in because they can now breathe the smoke. Uh, their throats are starting to hurt. Uh, their eyes are are burning and one of the things that people that fight fire say all the time is when a fire gets close it is very very loud it sounds like the roar of a jet engine the the, the temperature around them is about 55 degrees celsius it's starting to get very warm and then and then the adrenaline kicks in and people begin to run as fast as they can for for safety uh, one of the guys, though, in the group, his name is Harrison. He just, he just sits down. 
because Harrison has actually been fighting the fires for four hours already. He was there before anybody else showed up, so he's exhausted. He's done for. He just sits down, and the moment is so desperate that no one stops to encourage Harrison. It's kind of like a every man for himself as they begin to run. And as they kind of uh, get closer to the ridge, there's this open area that's covered in uh, cheek grass and fescue. Those are plant names, in case you were wondering. But it's, it's really dry. And Dodge knows instantly that this is a tinderbox. This is the most dangerous situation you could be in. And when the fire will hit this tinderbox, the fire will be able to travel 600 feet per minute. So there's a lot of things that are happening. At the same time, the smoke clears for just a moment and the men are able to see the ridge in the distance. And the ridge is 200 yards away. 200 yards away. Dodge does the math. In this tinderbox, the fire will catch up to them in 30 seconds. Safety is 200 yards away. What are they going to do? So today, we're looking at a story in the Bible of another high-tense situation. Um, if you have your Bible with you, uh, please open it to Numbers 32, 1 to 4. So we're going to be in Numbers uh, 32, 1 to 4. Four. I'll just give you a little bit of background of this. We've had the 12 tribes of Israel, and they've been wandering around the desert. You know, they, they've gone out of Egypt. The Bible tells us, they tell us this whole story. They've been wandering around the desert. They're on their way to the promised land. You, you know some of those songs. I'm on my way to the promised land. Right? They're on their way. But, but in this story, they are almost there. They are just about to cross over. So that's kind of the background. And two tribes out of the group want to change the plan a little bit. They have an idea. Uh, it's going to be Reuben and Gad. Two tribes. And they come before uh, Moses and some of the other leaders to present their new idea. So, so here it is. Uh, Numbers 32 verses 1 to 4. <clears throat> and this is what it says. The Reubenites and Gadites, who had very large herds and flocks, saw that the lands of Jazer and Gilead were suitable for livestock. So they, gave, they came to Moses and Eliezer the priest and to the leaders of the community and said, Adaroth, Dibbin, Jazar, Nimrah, Heshbon, Elilia, Sebam, Nebo, and Beon. You like those names? Uh, verse 4. The land the Lord subdued before the people of Israel are suitable for livestock, and your servants have livestock. Verse 5. If we have found favor in your eyes, they said, let this land be given to your servants as our possession. Do not make us cross the Jordan. So the suggestion that they're making to Moses is actually a good thing. This story has happened before in the Bible, by the way. Um, sometimes when flocks get too big and there's not enough pasture, uh, there's conflict, there's tension, it's bad. And it's happened before in the past where if you see some good flock, you kind of split the group up. It's, it's a good idea. And the way they present the idea to Moses, they do it in a really respectful way. Um, they say that phrase, if we have found favor. And, and, and that phrase is kind of alluding to the fact that they, have actually, they should find favor because they have been faithful to Moses. In the previous chapter, it tells us that, that Reuben and Gad have been warriors. They've been part of battles. They have been faithful uh, to Moses, so they act respectfully. They ask respectfully. So they come to Moses. And this is what you need to know about Moses. At this time in the story, Moses is the man. I'm not just saying that. He, he's the man. In, in the Bible, when, when you're comparing all the heroes in the Bible, Moses is like, is like the Batman. Of You know, you got your Supermans, your, what's that, Green Lantern maybe? Spider, whatever. But, but Moses, he's one of the founding members okay he's done the red sea that's that's a big deal he's done he's done some plagues he's one of the only people in the bible who can actually who actually has seen god god passed in front of him so how will moses this bible hero react to this reasonable request well 
Moses takes a reasonable request and he turns it into a high tension situation. Moses gets a little emotional when they bring this request. Moses will speak in a way that tells us his heart. He just lets it all go. Here's some of the words that he says um, as he throws his, what's the technical word? Hissy fit of biblical proportions. That's what it says. Verse 10, he says, talking about the past, the Lord's anger was aroused. Verse 13, the Lord's anger burned. Verse 14, now you are making the Lord even more angry. Just a, just a small aside, by the way, Moses is bringing his own baggage and he's covering it with religion. Do you see that? It's, he's getting emotional and he's saying it's the Lord's anger. Verse, verse 15, Moses says, what you're doing, you will cause the destruction of everyone. Does that, does that sound familiar? That's a little bit of the, of the mom card. Are you trying to kill me with what you're doing? This is what Moses is doing. And then, and then he, 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 he ups the ante. Uh, verse, verse 14, Moses hits them with judgment. He, he calls them, you brood of sinners. He hasn't asked any questions. Moses hasn't asked any questions. Hasn't, hasn't uh, had a conversation. There's no explanation. He is already jumping to judgment. Very harsh judgment. Your actions are going to kill everybody. You guys are a brood of sinners. And w what's funny about this story, by the way, is that this group is the world's largest youth group. This is a brand new generation. The previous generation uh, has passed away. Everyone here is young. They're inexperienced. The, the burden of communication, this is a hard lesson, falls on the leadership. And Moses doesn't do that. He cannot communicate. This intergenerational communication, he completely uh, fails at it. So have you ever done that? Have you ever had a situation where your reaction doesn't match the situation? Maybe it's a conversation you're having and all of a sudden you say something and you're like, where in the world did that come from? Um, people call that triggers. There are some things that have happened in our lives, um, some situations that if we get a word, a feeling, a particular situation, it will trigger something in you, a deep guttural emotional response. Check it out. Um, because when you start noticing those cues, the previous time you were here in this situation, it was unpleasant, whatever it is. So you fight, so you fight the situation. Maybe it's, um, you, you're getting a familiar feeling of commitment to a relationship, uh, to a small group, to a ministry, to, to a team, whatever it is. But the last time you committed, it ended bad. So you fight it. The last time you heard words like this, they were followed by uh, betrayal. So you bail. Uh, the last time you tried spirituality, the last time you, you tried to stand up for God, you, you fell flat on your face, you were embarrassed. So that's not for you. So you run away. And here's what, here's what happens is we're actually bringing a, a lens from our past to look at our future. And the result is you will always lead your life from your wounding. Whatever choices you make from now on happen from your wounding. Uh, this is uh, an author, Friedrich Fabricius. This is what he says. Many of us spend far too much of our present reliving stressful memories of our past. Simply recalling social slights, workplace confrontations, and nerve-wracking assignments can be enough to reactivate the threat response. Noradrenaline, the stress-related neurotransmitter, uh, processes recent events. You recall events with the emotional baggage that may have traveled with them when they first occurred. Your brain actually, actually marks it when you've been hurt, when you've been wounded. And just remembering it makes it like it's happening all over again. Because you see, uh, 
Moses has been in this situation before. Moses has seen all the same markers. He's recognizing some same things and he's going to bring the same emotion. We find it in verse 8. Numbers 32 verse 8 says, This is what your fathers did when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to look over the land. After they went up to the valley of Eshcol and viewed the land, they discouraged the Israelites from entering the land the Lord had given them. Verse 12. Not one except Caleb, John of Jephunneh, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, and Joshua, son of Nun, for they followed the Lord wholeheartedly. Did you hear that word? Uh, Not one, except Caleb and Joshua. Not one. Because you see, uh, Moses had a dream. He was going to make it into the promised land, and in front of his eyes, he saw all hope disappear. And he actually is is wounded from this and he never recovers from it. In fact, later on in the story, Moses is going to be so frustrated that he that he forfeits his calling when he strikes a rock. He never heals from his wounded. He displays frustration. And this this was Moses, because you see what actually happened to Moses is his brain was hijacked. (laughs) Sometimes our brains are hijacked because emotions can be a funny thing. Um, some, of, some of you are familiar with this. It's called the limbic system, right? You've got your, your sympathetic nervous system. Um, that's your fight, flight or fight response, you know, controlled by your amygdala, uh, those kinds of things. Here's what happens when the limbic system kicks in, a fight or flight, your higher order thinking turns off. You, 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 you can't do it. You, you stop being creative. You cannot problem solve anymore. You cannot see new solutions when you respond in fear or anger. But you know, your body has another system, uh, a parasympathetic system, and it's supposed to reset when you've gone through fear and stress. Um, th- this system is actually, they, they call it the rest and digest system, right? Um, when this system never kicks in, uh, your ability to show discipline goes down, right? When was the last time you opened that sleeve of Oreos? Come on, testify. It happened when you were tired. That (laughs) your system never kicked in. Um, Enough sleep is important so that the limbic system doesn't take over. Uh, This is another quote from a book called The Leading Brain so that uh, your limbic system doesn't take over. Sleep deprived people are 60% more likely to be emotionally controlled. So you've got this fight or flight system. You have another system that's supposed to uh, reset you, uh, rest and digest system. Here, here's the most, um, the, the saddest part of the story is that the actions that Moses is taking, right? The comments that he's making are about to bring the future that he dreads. It's an ironic twist. Moses, by saying and judging and just exploding on these guys, is about to split the nation, the thing that he fears the most. So we're having this conversation and you're like, that's me. Yeah, yeah, I do that all the time. Wow, I just did it, I just did it this morning. I'm, I'm thinking it right now. What do you do? What do you do? What's, what's helpful in this story? Uh, first thing is, in the moment, the most important thing is awareness. Awareness of, of what you do. Here's, here's a fun word. And you could just learn this word just so you could uh, impress your friends, maybe. The word is metacognition. It means thinking about thinking it's just being aware of how you think knowing that sometimes your thinking is being hijacked so in the moment when awareness hits sometimes sometimes you need to know that you have to walk away from a situation your emotions have taken over your you're fighting or, or or fleeing you have to walk away from the situation sometimes you can't walk away from the situation so you have to be quiet, even though you want to talk. <laughs> That's how that works. 
in, in, in other areas, it's just about getting through the day without making a major decision that you will regret later. So in the spiritual world, um, there, is a, there is a concept of resetting. It's called meditation. Uh, we have a little bit here, Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. This is, this is your quiet time. We call it quiet time. Do you hear that word? It's, it's, it's a time when you can, you can be still. That's intentional. It's a time of reflection when you can think about your day, bring, bring your day before God. All, all those things bring it before God. It's when you can reset your goals in the presence of a holy God who has a plan for you about getting, uh, getting perspective. There's one more quote here from uh, Friedrich Fabricius. It says, Ironically, one of the reasons so many people suppress their emotions instead of acknowledging them is because they're convinced that acknowledging their stress will only make matters worse. They fear that by labeling their emotions, they will be in danger of losing control. In fact, the opposite is true. Research has shown that labeling the source of your stress lessens the activation of the amygdala, the primary source of your flight or fight response. So the mere fact of reflecting and thinking about what's happening is beneficial. That alone, awareness, because if you don't reset, if you don't take this time for your own personal health, you will always lead from your wounding, from the last wound you received. You will quit too early right before the turnaround because you've been there before. You will live in panic. You'll avoid new opportunities. You'll destroy sabotage relationships. You will sell your future to protect your past. So they'd arrived at an area, open area of cheatgrass and fescue. It was just a tinderbox. Um, Dodge knew that the fire when it would hit here would, would jump to 600 feet per minute. He also knew that the ridge was 200 yards away. He could estimate that they had 30 seconds before the fire would overtake them. It's close, but for exhausted firefighters, they weren't going to make it. So what does Dodge do? In the moment, he, he stops. And he stops, he takes a breath. It's, it's smoke-filled, it hurts. And he stops to, to think. He stops to think. Then he reaches into his back pocket and he pulls out some matches and he lights a fire around himself. He creates this burn mark, this scorch mark as, as the grass around him go, goes up in flames. The, the men running around look, look at him and they think that he's crazy. He begins to yell at them um, this way. Come in here. It's safe here. Come in here. Come in here into, into the scorch mark. But, but, but the men, they, they can see the ridge. Whatever they see that he's doing just, just doesn't make any sense. Why would you go there when your entire body is telling you to go somewhere else? As he continues uh, to yell at his man, two, two, two of the men, uh, Rumsey and Sally, as they're running, they see a crack in the rock, a crevice, and they, and they squeeze through. They manage to get themselves inside. And before they get all the way through, they look back and they see Dodge take out a handkerchief, uh, soak it in water and put it over his mouth as, as the firestorm sweeps over. Um, it's so intense that the winds pick him up three times in the air, throw him up three times in the air. After all is said and done, there are only three survivors. Rumsey and Sally who jumped into the crevice and, and Dodge who, who stopped to think and did this procedure that saved his life, which is now taught to all uh, smoke jumpers in the world. Uh, today, he stopped to think. So what happens in the story of Moses? Moses is actually shown up by a group of teenagers. This is what they say, verse 16. Then they came up to him and said, we would like to build pens here for our livestock, 
and cities for our women and children, but we will arm ourselves for battle and go ahead of the Israelites until we have brought them to their place. Meanwhile, our women and children will live in fortified cities. They are the ones that come up with a solution. They come up with a win-win solution, a win-win-win solution where uh, the armies of Israel are supported and their flocks are fed. They are the only ones in this story among leaders who remain themselves who remain open to a bold new future. So uh, I just want to leave three things with you from this story. There might be more stuff, but I just want to highlight three things that we can take away uh, from, from the story of Moses. The first one is, your past does not dictate your future. That's true. Your, your past does not dictate your future. In fact, your current situation does not dictate your future. Because if your past dictates your future, well then you will always lead from past failures, from past woundings, from a small world. Your world will always be small. You will avoid the new because failing again will hurt because failure hurts. Your memories are too heavy. Your past does not dictate your future. Second, second thing, take some quiet time. On a regular basis, take some quiet time. This, this is a time when you can, you can clean the slate. On a, on, on a physical level, this, this, this is a time of rest, um, of sleep. Did you know that sometimes the most spiritual thing that you can do is take a nap? Man, I want to be very spiritual. Take, take some quiet time. And in this quiet time, uh, there's this thing. The scriptures speak about it all the time. And we understand it intellectually, but sometimes we don't dive in completely. And this is forgive. You have to learn to forgive yourself for the things that you've messed up. You, you, you have to take that step to forgive. And, and, and people that have wronged you. People that have wounded you, you have to learn to forgive. But there's also this, this other aspect of forgiveness we don't really talk about. And it's, and it's this. <clears throat> some of your dreams, some of your aspirations and dreams, they've been shattered. And you can't just say, oh, it's forgiven. You actually have to grieve your losses. It's okay. You have to grieve your losses or you don't move on. You actually just bring that with you to your next thing grieve your losses because if, if, if you don't um, it will destroy your future and it happens to the best of us it happens to Moses and and the last thing that we see in the story is stay open that's right uh, stay open don't prejudge a situation listen to the whole story don't don't jump to the conclusions don't jump to conclusions um approach life as though every situation is unique that every situation might be a new opportunity for growth stay open that's where new ideas come from isaiah 43:19 and this is a we'll end see i am i am doing a new thing now it springs up Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. From the grave, hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave.
Christ is risen from the grave. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, fear, where is your power? The mighty King of kings has disarmed you. Hallelujah, Christ risen. 